Thank you. The next item of business is topical questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and responses. And at question number one, I call Sue Webber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the investigation into the recent spike in deaths of newborn babies. Minister Marie Todd. Firstly, um, I want to offer my condolences to all families affected. While we might expect to see natural fluctuations throughout the year, given the high levels of deaths noticed, uh, noted in March, we do intend to investigate further. All NHS boards use the perinatal mortality review tool to support high-quality standardised review of each neonatal death. In addition, some may be subject to a more in-depth review as part of the maternity and neonatal perinatal adverse event review process for Scotland. In addition to those local reviews of each case, Scottish Go Government jointly with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Scottish Perinatal Network and Public Health Scotland will undertake further investigations into the potential causes of the increased neonatal deaths to understand and address any possible contributing factors so that we can continue to improve the care of the smallest and sickest babies in Scotland. Sue Weber. Thank you for your answer, Minister. And I too wish to pass on my condolences to all of those families affected. Although there is so little known about these deaths at the moment, it is important that health visits are running as normal, even despite the huge pressures facing our NHS. Do we have the right resources in place at the moment to deliver the three home visits as outlined in the Health Visitors Home Visiting Pathway? And can the Minister explain what mitigations are being put in place while we investigate the causal factors behind these tragic baby deaths? Minister. So, certainly throughout the pandemic, despite the um, moving around of staff that occurred at all, all times during the pandemic, um, maternity and neonatal care and family care was prioritised. So people in roles like midwifery and in roles like health visitor weren't moved to the same extent as some other roles in hospitals because we knew just how important the work that they do is. Um, there are um, undoubtedly, um, I mean, the number of deaths although absolutely tragic, is thankfully small, and that makes it particularly difficult to pick up on trends and what might be the underlying causes. But we are looking very carefully at the um, rate of um, death in March, and we will absolutely learn any lessons that can possibly be learned and ensure that um, if there are any particular institutional lessons that need to be learned, that that will be taken forward um, as well. Sue Weber. Oh, God, oh, no. Unfortunately, presenting officer, I only have one supplementary. Thank you, Ms. Weber. I will take Paul O'Kane. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And I would like to add my condolences to anyone who has lost a baby. These are indeed tragedies. Uh, I think the government has been right to make clear that there is no link uh, to neonatal COVID uh, or to the COVID-19 vaccine. But Dr Sarah Stock, uh, who co-led the COVID-19 in Pregnancy Scotland study, has said that further research is required to understand the effects of COVID-19 in pregnancy, because uh, COVID-19 can cause uh, pregnancy complications, such as early birth. She has also said that uh, the wider impacts of COVID-19 on a NHS workforce and services needs looked at. So, Can the Minister confirm that the inquiry will look at these issues? Uh, and Can she say when she anticipates updating Parliament further on these issues? Minister. So I can certainly say that there are several surveillance programmes which are focusing on the direct impact of COVID-19 on pregnant women and babies, and those are underway, including the COPS and the BPSU study, both of which um, are, are looking in detail at population-level monitoring um, and analysis of the occurrence and outcomes of COVID-19 infection in pregnancy. Um, of course, worldwide, the vaccine has been used in millions of pregnant women. Um, and I know there has been a lot of concern about um, using the vaccine in pregnancy. The evidence thus far suggests that the virus is significantly more dangerous to pregnant mums and to babies, and that the, the um, vaccine improves um, the safety um, at, at the moment. So I would like to give reassurance on that front. Undoubtedly, this is an evolving situation, and it is really important that we think about all the factors that might have contributed to the current um, rise in, in neonatal deaths, and that does include 
um, the pressures on workforce you know it occurred that particular peak occurred at a time when workforce were under the most immense stress that they have experienced throughout the pandemic. So we will be looking at those issues as well. Um, and it is important that we learn lessons and make changes going forward um, as far as we can to ensure that we um, are absolutely taking care of any preventable um, factors which might have contributed to these neonatal deaths. Thank you. Question number two, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what its reaction is to the reported awarding of almost £1 million compensation from Police Scotland to an ex-officer following an employment tribunal ruling of victimisation. Mr Ash Reagan. The Scottish Government takes extremely seriously any concerns raised about Police Scotland, uh, whether that is by the public or by officers themselves. And when things go wrong and mistakes are made, the police must be held to account and lessons must be learned and improvements must be made. So the findings of the Employment Tribunal clearly demonstrated that Ms Malone's experience were wholly unacceptable, and this has been uh, fully recognised by the Chief Constable. He's apologised to the claimant, making clear that misogyny, sexism and discrimination of any kind are deplorable and have no place in society or in policing, emphasising his personal commitment to leading change in policing in Scotland. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the Minister for that answer. And she's right. The police must be held to account. Because the situation that Rona Malone faced, one of bullying, harassment, and ultimately suppression of her complaint, uh, was all underpinned by a culture that was described at the tribunal as an old boys' club. But nobody should be under any illusion that this is isolated or it was unavoidable. Dame, Angelini, uh, Dame Ailish Angelini's report into complaints handling highlighted the treatment of minority groups and, mon and officers leaving on account of the culture they faced. And avoidable because I personally took the account of a whistleblower to the most senior levels of the police, including uh, a meeting where I um, uh, described it to the Chief Constable, and nothing took place. So while I acknowledge the Chief Constable's uh, commitment to change, and indeed the report from the Police Service of Northern Ireland that, that is uh, forthcoming, I have written to the Chief Constable to ask him to review the circumstances leading to Ms Malone's departure from the police uh, force and to hold those uh, to account, those who failed to examine her complaint and those who suppressed it. And I would ask if the uh, Minister and the Scottish Government would join me in making that call to the Chief Constable. Minister. Um, I thank the member for, for raising um, you know, his personal experience um, that he's had with Police Scotland in reporting incidences like this. And I, I would expect the Chief Constable to reflect carefully on what Daniel Johnson has said in the Chamber today. Um, in terms of the, the substance of his question, um, obviously in the days after the judgment was issued, the Chief Constable made that commitment to commission the external police service to carry out the independent review of this particular employment tribunal decision and make any recommendations which will require action by Police Scotland, whether they related to performance, to culture or to conduct. And obviously we know that the um, Police Service of Northern Ireland is, is finalising that work. I would say the service has recognised that improvements are needed and Police Scotland has established also a strategic oversight board to push forward um, progress that is needed on equality and diversity within policing. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you. And I thank the Minister for that answer. But we must enhance complaints handling procedures for police when they make complaints about the service that they serve within. Uh, the Angelini review made some good points, but the last thematic progress report was at the end of 2021. Ultimately, in this circumstance, there is at least one other police officer who left directly because of making those complaints, and other police that left armed policing. So will uh, the Minister commit to uh, expediting the recommendations from the Angelini Review, specifically with uh, renewed focus on complaints handling and whistleblowing, including creation of a third-party organisation to handle that, and also enhancing the perk power, uh, powers of the PERC around uh, practice and policy review and the power to call in complaints when the PERC no longer has confidence in the police force's handling of them? Minister. I would say to the member that um, many of the things that he has mentioned just there are things that are under um, consideration by, uh, by the government at the moment, um, but I will ask the Cabinet Secretary to respond in detail to some of the points that um, the member has raised there. Um, on the Angelini review, obviously that was action that was taken by the Scottish Government, um, admittedly it was 2018, uh, to review uh, police complaints handling, things like investigations and misconduct in Scotland, recognising that potentially there was an issue there. 
So the Scottish Government um, accepted the majority of those recommendations, um, but we're shortly going to be consulting on legislative proposals with a view to delivering new laws to improve transparency and to further strengthen um, public confidence in the police. And this will consult on areas such as duties of candour and cooperation, gross misconduct proceedings and adopting barred and advisory lists in Scotland to strengthen Police Scotland's vetting processes. And these measures will aim to ensure that anyone who doesn't meet the high standards required uh, are not able to continue working within policing. Um, I note uh, the comments that um, the member made about um, the implementation of the recommendations of the Angelini review. Um, I would gently say to him that it was only six months or less than six months, I would say, since the last thematic report. Um, a significant amount of work has been underway um, to implement that, and currently 34 of those recommendations have been implemented to date. Russell Finlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I have been investigating Scotland's police complaint system for years. It is broken and unjust, with taxpayers' money being used to crush and silence officers and the public. Police Scotland tried to buy Rona Marone's silence with an NDA. Other officers signed gagging orders because they did not have the strength or the money to fight for justice. Given that safeguards already exist to protect victims and sensitive information without the need for NDAs, will the Minister commit to ending their use in policing? Minister. Okay, so my understanding is that obviously an NDA was not used in the final settlement that, uh, of the case that we are um, discussing today. I would also say that obviously NDA is part of um, UK employment law, and I would say that there are some legitimate uses for NDAs, but they should not be used to cover up um, discriminatory behaviour, misconduct and um, things of that nature. Um, I would say that the, the Chief Constable um, has responded to this particular case by apologising to the claimant, um, making clear that sexism and discrimination um, has no place in the policing, and also making a personal commitment to leading change in policing in Scotland. Uh, the majority of police officers, I think we would all agree, they work very hard to protect our communities. But when things do go wrong, obviously as they have done in this case, uh, the member is quite right. We must have robust, we must have transparent mechanisms in place for investigating those complaints. Now, a great deal of work has been done on this already. I've obviously responded to, um, to Daniel Johnson on the issue of the Angelini review. But there is more work that needs to be done on this, and the service has accepted that more work needs to be done on this. So we will keep Parliament informed of the work and the progress that is being made. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Minister says, the Scottish Government has already taken steps to improve transparency by introducing the organisational duty of candour in 2018. Can the Minister outline what further steps the Scottish Government is taking to improve transparency and further strengthen public confidence in the police? Because, as the Minister has already alluded to, where the delivery of standards in public services falls short, individuals and their families should rightly be able to get answers and justice. Minister. Yes, so in 2018, uh, we took the action to commission Dame Angelini to review the police complaints handling investigations and misconduct in Scotland. And her recommendations provide a very strong platform with which to drive forward meaningful improvement in collaboration with our partners across the policing sector here in Scotland. Um, we are shortly going to consult on some further legislative proposals with a view to delivering new laws which will improve transparency and further strengthen confidence in the police. And these measures will aim to ensure that anyone who does not meet the high standards that are required are not able to continue working within policing. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I refer uh, the Chamber to my register of interests. This is but the latest example of its type in Police Scotland. And there are so many other cases of bullying and victimisation of whistleblowers in other public services as well. The NHS as has been widely reported. Does the Minister agree that these examples make the case for establishing by statute an independent office of the whistleblower for Scotland? Minister. Um, I'd have to give that uh, proposal some um, consideration. I'll come back to the member on that point. But in general, I would say that we do have a high quality police service here in Scotland. But I think it is right that when things go wrong, um, Police Scotland must be held to account and lessons must be learned. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to assure the Chamber 
that uh, the Chief Constable in this case has taken um, responsibility for this and he has personally committed to driving and leading that change in policing in Scotland to ensure that those lessons are learned and that improvements are being made. Question number three, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the anticipated delivery date of the ferries under construction at Ferguson Marine in light of recent reports that the number of faults in the two vessels has arisen. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Well, the letter sent from Ferguson's to the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee at the end of March sets out the new timetable and costs for the vessels following the legacy cabling issue. Critically, that new schedule has been developed in partnership with CMAL, and CMAL have endorsed that timetable. 801 will be delivered between March and May 2023, and 802 will be delivered between October and December 2023. At the request of the NZ Committee, the Ferguson Marine Chief Executive updates the committee on a quarterly basis, and the next update is due at the end of June. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? It's also a very welcome shift in tone from the SNP benches after the disgraceful comments made by one of their MPs in Westminster who asserted that we somehow need to change the record and stop talking about ferries. Well, let me say to the government benches, the islanders of Arran that I spoke to this morning are furious and they want us to do anything but change the record on the issue of ferries, Presiding Officer. And sadly, what I didn't hear in the answer, other than repetition of what we heard months ago, was not an answer to the question about this increased level of uh, faults in the vessels. I want a cast iron, iron guarantee. So do our islanders that vessel 801 will be in service by this time next year and vessel 802 will be in service by the autumn of next year. So, officer, we all wish the new chief executive at Ferguson the very best of luck in delivering these vessels, but our islanders want to know if their vessels will actually be in service. Let me ask the cabinet secretary, on a confidence level of 1 to 10, how confident is she that the Glen Sanox will be sailing passengers to Brodick by this time next year, and in the spirit of taking responsibility, will she put her job in the line if it doesn't? Well, um, I'd remind the member that I represent a community that is set to benefit from one of these vessels, and I was in Sky as recently as Friday speaking to them, so he's not the only one that represents island communities. In terms of uh, the faults that he's identified, I wonder if I could uh, specifically address that. A senior member of the CMAL team has quite recently been seconded into the Ferguson Marine uh, Senior uh, Management, and CMAL's owner's observation reports, which is what I think he's referring to, are now treating as the snagging and defect list, and that's typical of any large construction or shipbuilding project. The list of OORs was 237 in March as engagement, and the relationship between CMAL and FMPG improved and between the respective teams. Good progress is being made in clearing those issues. So the list of OORs was assessed and 119 are assessed as category one. The rest are assessed as minor snagging. Within 119, there are engineering solutions for 83, leaving 36 that are still being worked on. Solutions are expected progressively without delays or impacts on the programme. That work, presiding officer, briefly is being led by the FMPG compliance director and until recently he was also employed by Lloyd's Register of Shipping, the classification society that surveys both Glen Sanex and 802. The CEO is a naval architect and a classification surveyor by background. He is also personally engaged in the process, particularly with issues relating to stability and safety. So solving all these issues is critically important. It is part of the programme and I think we have got the best people on the ground to do that. Jamie Green. Well, we do have good people, but what we don't have is an answer. No cast iron guarantee, and once again, no one in the SNP is willing to take full responsibility for the delivery of this project or the delivery of those vessels. Of course, this stems back to the miraculous missing email, which the First Minister gleefully attributes all the blame on this to Derek Mackay, an email which magically appeared in the opening minutes of an opposition debate. But that email still does not answer key questions in the eyes of Audit Scotland. Why did the contract pass two rounds of due diligence, contra to legal advice? Why was 80 per cent of the agreed price for the ships paid when the progress on the build of the ships was anything but that? And did the First Minister herself, herself give the go-ahead for the contract to be awarded to her friend, Mr McCall? There clearly remains a very real risk, a very real risk that these ferries will not be delivered more than five years after their due date, 
and the cost is now spiralling to more than a quarter of a billion pounds of taxpayers' money. The Cabinet Secretary can't answer those questions that Audit Scotland want answers to. Will she answer these two from me? Will the Government today commit to the Deputy First Minister making a full statement to this Parliament on his role in all of this? And secondly, will the Government agree to a full public inquiry into their handling of this shambles? Well, uh, Presiding Officer, I am here once again another week answering questions on Ferguson Marine. So in terms of scrutiny, scrutiny for the last uh, two months has probably uh, not exceeded any other form of uh, scrutiny. We have said when it comes to a public inquiry, we have of course um, accepted the recommendations of the Audit Scotland report. And one of those recommendations is to persevere with getting the boats delivered and after they have been delivered, to do a, a more in-depth uh, lessons learned. Obviously, the Audit Scotland report comes after the cross-party uh, inquiry by, led by the, the REC committee, and so there has been a comprehensive um, overview of the situation already, with more than 200 documents uh, having been published. In terms of uh, the specific question he asks, I have been absolutely crystal clear on what I expect from Ferguson Marine in completing the vessels. It was not a document that resulted in delayed construction to the vessels. That is a question of construction, and he doesn't need to believe me on that. He just needs to read the Audit Scotland report on that. That is quite clear that the reason why they are over, um, overdue and over budget is a question of construction. And that is why my priority, and I was at Ferguson Marine as recently as last week, that's why my priority is to make sure that these boats are delivered, not just for his constituents, but for my constituents too. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the workforce of Ferguson's are entitled to expect better than these constant attacks from the Tories, where Mr Green actually was in the yard only last month and heard exactly what was said by the managing director. Mr Green did hear that, but certainly, presiding officer, the constant attacks from the Tories and also Labour on their treatment, in the words of the GMB, and as I quote, as a political football. Cabinet Secretary. Um, the member is absolutely right, and again, it is not about what I say or what the government says, it is about what the workers say. To hear the GMB blasting the Labour Party and also to hear the Conservatives dismiss the concerns of workers is, I think, really problematic. I was at Ferguson Marine last week. I spoke directly to union representatives and to the workers, and their morale is being eroded. The future of the yard is being questioned as a result of elements of the discussion that is going on amongst uh, politicians. I think it's absolutely right that the opposition hold the government to account, and I think it's absolutely right that the government uh, ensure that there are plans in place to resolve the issues. That is why I am here again answering questions, why we've had several uh, debates on the issue. It's one thing to criticise government, it is quite another to constantly erode the morale of the workers who have a job to do and whose job is based on their skills and on their talent. Graham Simpson. Many thanks, uh, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of a report uh, in the press today of an email sent uh, from Derek Mackay to Stuart Macmillan. Um, she knows that one of the issues around all this has been the lack of a refund guarantee. Um, according to the email from Mr Mackay, um, he says, uh, and this was sent in February 2015, while CMAL's board, in line with standard industry practice, has a preference for refund guarantees, it has, on occasion, taken alternative approaches to ensure that shipyards, including Ferguson, under its previous owners were not excluded from bidding for government contracts. So what does the Cabinet Secretary have to say to that, and can she explain um, why the government has been taking such a cavalier approach to ferry procurement? Well, 
Secretary. The member will be aware, because I'm sure he's read the Audit Scotland report in great detail, that the Audit Scotland report identifies areas where government has indeed made changes already. They've made changes when it comes to government investment in private companies, and we've also made changes to procurement. And the example of that is very much to be seen in the most recent contract that has been awarded. It, the contract was awarded by CMAL in its capacity as procuring authority. That's well known, well documented. It's also well known and well documented because of uh, documents that have been in the public domain now for um, almost two years, that CMAL did express concerns about a full refund guarantee, and the documentation which has been in the public domain for two years, although it took the opposition quite a while to find it, um, because uh, obviously uh, the, the critical email is the 8th of October, which shows that there were mitigations put in place to combat the lack of a full refund guarantee, including uh, CMAL taking ownership of all equipment and materials that were supplied to the yard, all suppliers having to ensure that they had a full refund guarantee and the schedule of payments being changed. Neil Booby. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary says she expects the vessels to be completed next year. It is clear that island communities expect a national ferry building programme to create a modern and resilient ferry fleet. The next stage of replacement of the ferry fleet will be to replace smaller ferries, work that could easily be done at Ferguson's. On the issue of supporting the workforce, assuming the current timescales are met, will she confirm it is the Government's attention, intention to award the contract for the replacement of Calmac ferries to the yard, or will that work be going abroad to Turkey too? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank the member for that question? Because I think it's the first time he's asked me a question about the future of Ferguson Marine. And I think that is far more critical right now eh, in terms of ensuring that there is a pipeline of work um, at uh, the Yard. The Yard are actively pursuing opportunities for uh, future vessel contracts. I don't know if he joined the delegation of cross-party MSPs that went to the Yard uh, last month, but the, the Chief Executive will probably have outlined um, what they are doing in terms of securing future uh, work. And we will do all that we can to help the Yard um, secure those opportunities. Um, he is right in identifying that there is a £580 million ferry investment programme that is underway right now, and that will include the Small Vessels Replacement Programme. So these conversations are actively ongoing, and I think this is the kind of territory we should be on if we want to boost the morale of the workers. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. I will allow a moment before we move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is a debate on motion 4428 in the name of Marie Goujon on supporting Scotland's islands on their journey to become carbon neutral. I would be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate could press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Marie Goujon to speak to and move the motion. Up to 15 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to open this debate today in support of Scotland's islands on their journey to become carbon neutral. Today, I will outline the Scottish Government's progress in supporting our island communities in their climate change journey, not least our exciting Carbon Neutral Islands project, which puts islands at the forefront of our climate change ambitions. First of all, I, though I want to acknowledge and to thank the members for the proposed amendments to the, mo the motion today, and to set out that I am happy to support the amendment from Rhoda Grant, confirming that moving to net zero requires a just transition. The Carbon Neutral Islands project will not only benefit the environment, but will support local economies, green skills and general well-being. 
and I'm also pleased to support the amendment today from Rachel Hamilton. The Scottish Government remains committed to supporting our island communities and this innovative project that highlights islands as